everyone. My name is Goran Rizav. I am the head of the Media for Democracy program at Metamorphosis Foundation. And today we have a guest from Finland, uh, Mr. Tapio Pisalo, who is head of the international relations at the Hybrid Center of Excellence at Countering Hybrid Threats. Welcome. Thank you so much, Goran. Since you're coming from Finland, and Finland is widely considered as one of the most resilient countries to disinformation. Can you explain shortly how does Finland do it? Is there like some kind of magic formula that you can share, which can be reused here, for example? Uh, well, thank you so much. It's a very good question. Uh, but, uh, but first, let me emphasize that although I'm I also a Finn, uh, I'm basically here as a representative of the, of the Center of Excellence for Country Hyper Threats which is an international organization covering 36 countries uh, in Europe and, and America. Uh, but of course, I'll be happy to say a few words about my Finnish experience as well. And unfortunately, I don't think there is a magic formula. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really a complex uh, um, background for, for everything that builds resilience against disinformation. Um, but I will be happy to raise a few points and maybe some of those best practices might be useful for other countries as well. And um, I, I want to raise four main points, and, and those are basically media literacy, freedom and diversity of, uh, of the media environment, uh, then the language, um, and finally, trust uh, within the society. And, and first of all, on that um, media literacy, which is uh, really sort of uh, celebrated element of the of the Finnish uh, uh, resilience um, it, it really uh, is a decades long history of media education in the country and that's why it might be a, a bit difficult to to replicate it's not only taught in schools but also the civil society is is engaging uh, in part in that uh, media education of, of the youth um, and and it's very difficult to copy or or um, or build overnight, but at least in the long term, uh, some of those elements uh, could, of course, be brought to other countries as well. And I understand that North Macedonia is building some media education for for schools, for example, and that's a great first step. And it, it will take a long time, but uh, but it's really important to to start building it early. Uh, I I want to raise a, a point on the on the free and diverse. Uh, media environment. So Finland has a very strong freedom of, uh, uh, of press protected actually by a self-regulation body. I hear you have a similar here in North Macedonia. Um, although the media is getting slightly consolidated, at the same time, it hasn't really been politically biased. Um, and and that's, a, that's an important part. Um, and um, Finland also has its national public media called Finnish Broadcasting Company, uh, which is modeled on the on the BBC's example, uh, and it actually has quite a big role in a trustworthy uh, media, which is considered very objective in the society, and I think that's uh, that's one key element. But I I also think that Finland has at least to some extent been protected by the language. Uh, Finnish is part of a very small uh, Finno-Hungarian language uh, 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 language um, uh, family that has only about 20 million speakers, so it's it's very small and it has very complex grammar. And I think at least so far it has been very difficult uh, for machines to create fluent translations into uh, into Finnish, which is making it very difficult for foreign actors uh, to represent Finnish language. Uh, in in the media, social media, um, and that has maybe been a barrier uh, to to disinformation in Finland as well. Uh, and finally, the high level of uh, trust in the population is really important. Up to fifty percent of Finns trust their government. Even eighty five percent actually trust the national media, the Finnish broadcasting company. So it's a it's a very level high level of trust in the society, and. And that trust also helps uh, tackle some of these disinformation narratives. And I think a good example of this is that uh, when the Baltic Connector pipeline was just disrupted in the Baltic Sea close to Finland, um, uh, the, uh, the government gave a press briefing 
and it immediately cut all the wings off the rumors and disinformation because everybody trusts the government enough uh, to believe that that narrative. And th this is probably the, what, one of the most difficult things to copy, uh, but building that trust in the society is is probably a very important element of uh, of countering disinformation as well. But I do have to say I'm also slightly concerned that even the even the Finnish resilience uh, might be more and more challenged by especially the the development of artificial intelligence and all these sophisticated language models, uh, many of them in uh, coming up in Finnish as well, and and the the sort of exponential dominance of artificially created uh, information uh, in the media and information space. So uh, this will definitely require more effective monitoring of the media environment, better countermeasures against disinformation, and uh, and maybe also uh, more efficient utilization of artificial intelligence for countering disinformation and identifying facts behind the uh, behind the lies. Yes. So it's something that has continued to develop throughout the years. It's, it hasn't stopped and waited for us to react, let's say, in a, in a way. I think it definitely has developed quite a bit. And, and one, one evidence of this was that, uh, that during the, uh, the elections, the European ele elections this year, um, Russia uh, was spreading up to 40 million reactions to different kinds of uh, uh, in narratives in the media space. And that really uh, gives a good picture of, of the extent of, of the challenge and uh, many of many of those certainly created by artificial intelligence. Yes. As you mentioned, you are the head of international relations at the Hybrid Center of Excellence. And um, it's an international network of 36 countries, including all NATO member states and all EU member states. And what they do is they pursue this whole of society approach towards countering hybrid threats. Can you explain a little more further what has been the focus on your work recently and why is this important? What kind of threats are we talking about? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. Um, and indeed, uh, we're really happy about that, that sort of reaching that milestone of universal participation by all EU members, all NATO members. Um, and also to emphasize that there are many NATO centers of excellence but the hybrid COE is is unique in bringing the EU and NATO together, and that's actually one one of uh, the the main objectives of our work, uh, putting the the EU and NATO to work together against hybrid threats. Uh, and our main aim uh, in our work is to strengthen the capacities of our participating states for countering hybrid threats. And what we mean by hybrid threats is uh, basically uh, fourfold strategic actions by hostile state or non-state actors, sometimes non-state actors that are working on behalf of uh, state actors as proxies. Uh, we see that uh, uh, hybrid threats are systematically tra targeting vulnerabilities in our societies. Uh, they're using a wide range of uh, different synchronized means uh, and avoiding identification and attribution, remaining below the threshold of war. And and basically, uh, our work is not only about the, the whole of society approach or the comprehensive model of security, but it definitely is one of the good practices. And it applies to, to uh, many different uh, uh, domains and, and many different ways of countering hybrid threats. Uh, the point is that unlike military threats, hybrid threats challenge many parts of our societies. Uh, and therefore, also identifying those hybrid threats and especially countering them requires a whole of society approach across the government, but also involving the civil society, involving the private sector, uh, and so on. Uh, some of the threats that we are focused on include uh, disinformation and psychological interference, uh, cyber attacks, emerging disruptive technologies, sabotage, both in the, in the physical domain, but also in the cyber domain, uh, election interference, economic interference, instrumentalization of mi migration, etc. It's actually a very broad, broad list of different kinds of threats that we're looking at, and we're also looking specifically at some of the the main hybrid threat actors, looking at uh, 
um, hybrid threats in different regions, including the Western Balkans and so on. So there really is uh, many different uh, scopes. Yes, um, so about two years ago, here in North Macedonia, dozens of schools, most of them in, in the capital of Skopje, received on their email addresses these false bomb threats. So this was ongoing for about six months. There were hundreds of, of false threats and the schools had to be evacuated very frequently. The parents were scared. Uh, the, the, uh, the whole society was on alert because of this and the media used this as a driver for, for government criticism and lowering the trust in the state institutions. Additionally, about the same time in February 2023, uh, the, the health insurance fund, the Macedonian health insurance fund was hacked through a ransomware attack, putting in jeopardy the data of every citizen and his health data, basically. So could you say that these two examples are part of the hybrid threats that you are working to prevent? This... Uh sounds like a very concrete example of a hybrid threat. And I'm really happy you brought it up because it, it really gives the local context to, to what we're talking about here. And uh, the, what, what really makes it a hybrid threat in, in my point of view is that it seems to be a strategic attack uh, by a foreign actor targeting societal vulnerabilities. And, and those are some of the, the sort of main uh, attributes of hybrid threats in our point of view. And it really also shows how much havoc some of these hybrid threats can wreak in, in a society, disrupting, in this case, education, scaring the population, dividing public opinion, and also undermining trust in the government, which, uh, which we ju just discussed is, is a really important uh, factor in encountering some of these threats. And it's probably no coincidence that, uh, that these events happen soon after North Macedonia closed its uh, airspace to Russia's foreign minister and also sent uh, lethal military aid to Ukraine. These are uh, some some sort of, of the incidents that might uh, incur such uh, hybrid threats. And, and we do uh, say that undermining support, of, uh, uh, support to Ukraine really seems to be one of Russia's immediate goals and objectives in its use of hybrid threats. And these are exactly the kinds of threats that uh, that we are supporting our participating states to counter. Uh, and while North Macedonia was not yet a um, uh, participating state of, of the hybrid COE at the time, I understood that that NATO offered its support uh, in that case. And and this is actually also a really important element of countering hybrid threats: uh, international cooperation, cooperation uh, among allies, uh, is is really crucial when when countering hybrid threats. And that's a gr good, uh, great symbol of, uh, of NATO coming together in your support in that case. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, North Macedonia is a member of the uh, Hybrid Center of Excellence for about one year, if I'm not mistaken. But it seems like even before that, that not many steps were taken in regards of countering uh, foreign information manipulation and interference, at least not publicly. Where do you see the role of small countries such as North Macedonia in this whole global effort? Um, indeed, like you mentioned, North Macedonia joined Herpes COE in October uh, 23. So we've been close, working closely together ever since for, for about a year now. Um, I think uh, countering foreign information manipulation and interference is a challenge to, to most of our participating states. Uh, with the quick development of uh, AI tools, for example, the, the stream of disinformation is, is exponentially increasing, if I can say so. There are some very good practice, practices on, on how to counter that uh, disinformation, but it also takes a lot of time and money. It really takes a lot of resources. And I know that many countries are ramping up their capabilities for monitoring their media in, uh, environment, monitoring their information spaces, in some cases, including using some of those AI tools uh, to map the, the media environment to, uh, to better 
identify the the threats and the disinformation narratives in the information space. Um, and I think cooperation with social media companies is also really important because they control such large parts of the of the media space, and they have a responsibility to counter disinformation too. Uh, so they should do, they should also have their internal policies in place. They should cooperate with government uh, in identifying disinformation and uh, and counter that disinformation. For example, by closing accounts. Uh, in the case of North Macedonia, uh, we have had uh, a lot of discussions with uh, with the current the new government, uh, and they do seem to take the threat very seriously, and they are building up defenses against uh, disinformation and foreign inter- interference. Uh, information manipulation so i think uh i i think uh they do seem to have a, a good concept of the threat and they do seem to be uh working a lot in order to counter it yes uh, and and also if you think about it it seems that the civil society here in, in north Macedonia has been, has been most active in terms of countering um and this information we as as metamorphosis foundation we have proposed to the previous government a similar whole of society approach in countering this information. It included various recommendations for different stakeholders that are involved. And um, they accepted the proposal formally, but uh, nothing much else has ca- has happened around it. And um, it's really strange because Finland is the first on the uh, global uh, literacy media literacy index and north macedonia is the last country on that index it's a good question but uh indeed like i mentioned um at least in my view and in my discussions with uh with the current government it seems that they they do have a strong approach on on countering disinformation they do seem to have a strong interest in applying the whole of society approach to countering disinformation, um, and I think this is uh, work that will uh, will very soon uh, begin. Uh, and I I see that uh, civil society organizations have a really important role uh, in the society in initiating public debate, bringing up issues, uh, taking them to the government, and and raising raising awareness on on uh, issues like in this case countering disinformation. Uh, but I, I also feel like uh, the initiative in the end has to come from, from the government itself uh, because uh, um, building up this whole society approach, uh, it, it does take a lot of cooperation and coordination uh, involving the, the civil society organizations, uh, organizations, finding the right ways for them to be represented, for example, in this coordination. And, and also in some cases, for example, uh, security uh, certificates uh, to be able to access information. Um, it is a lot of work, and and I think uh, the government has to have the lead in that work, but I do feel like initiatives like yours are really useful for uh, for the government to, to give them um, at least an idea of, of what the civil society expects of them and how the civil society would like to engage. Yes, um... In a, in a report that we are about to publish these days, um, we conclude that there is an ongoing effort to disturb the inter-ethnic relations in the country through foreign influence. Can you uh, explain why certain topics are more prone to be misused by foreign malign actors than others? What is the goal of these efforts? Well, this really goes back to to what we discussed about sort of how we see hybrid threats and how we define them. And and like I said, one of the, the element in, in hybrid threats is typically intentionally targeting vulnerabilities in societies. And in the case of North Macedonia and also the wider Western Balkan region, these inter-ethnic tensions are certainly one of the key vulnerabilities that can be abused by, by uh, foreign actors. Um, while in the case of North Macedonia, the Ovid framework ar- uh, agreement has been very robust, uh, but of course another one of those key vulnerabilities is the the EU integration process, uh, which is targeted by different kinds of anti-Western narratives across the region, and also creates a vulnerability uh, in the society that can be abused by by some foreign actors. 
Uh, I feel that the reason why hybrid threat actors are attacking these topics is that they're easy targets for stoking dis disagreement in the society, dividing the public opinion, and uh, and really sort of undermining national unity serves all the purposes of hybrid threat actors, including, like I mentioned, challenging decision-making, uh, diminishing support to Ukraine, diminishing support for the EU integration process. And these are all targets for, for hybrid actors. Uh, in our analysis, what Russia really wants is to maintain its sphere of influence in the Western Balkans uh, region. And of course, EU integration would undermine that, that sort of overall objective of, of Russia. And, and this is one reason why, why we feel that we should do our best to raise awareness of hybrid threats uh, and their objectives among the wider public as well, so that people would be aware of the threat and be responsive to, to react to some of these disinformation narratives as well. And uh, we feel that responding to, to these threat, uh, threats, it really requires broad awareness in the, in the public. It requires national unity, uh, which is uh, very strong here as well. It requires strong resilience in the society. It also requires support to the government for actions against some of these threats. But also good coordination and cooperation, like you mentioned, your initiative is a, is a good example of that. And uh, like I already said, strong international partnerships, strong alliances. Um, and these are certainly some of the topics that we are trying to support uh, our participating states government to tackle and, uh, and to build resilience with. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. Thank you so much.